gewoon één korte zin, een opmerking. Ik zit even te zoeken of iemand, steek even je hand op als je dat wil. Ik zie eigenlijk niemand. Ja, Tineke. Zou ik maar in Engels doen, hè? Is goed. Um, that, we are, that we are getting much uh, inspiration and um, have a good time together. Oké, dank je Tineke. I light the candle. Oké. Okay. And um, then now I want to introduce to you Rakesh. Um, I know Rakesh since I think 2012. We were together in a European Permaculture Teachers Partnership. It was really nice to meet and work two, three years together, meet in several occasions. One of it was in Bulgaria where we uh, had the European Permaculture Convergence. So it's really nice to uh, see you again, meet you again, Rakesh, and work together in this way. And uh, Rakesh is a uh, UK permaculture teacher. He is um, actually mostly abroad, very international oriented and going from to many, many places to support people to become more sustainable, to, to create more communities and to be, uh, to help people to, uh, how do you call this? Um, to work together in an in a equal way. So um, uh, Rakesh teaches permaculture. On his website, you can read, permaculture is a revolution disguised as gardening. I think that's a great slogan. I want to remember that one. He is also a um, teacher in food forest, in community building and in sociocracy. So who uh, better could we have tonight uh, for our webinar? So Rakesh, thank, well, uh, welcome very much. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. My English is a bit stuttering. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I think I can, I, I, uh, I give the, the, the microphone to you now, yeah, that um, you can okay. maybe introduce yourself even better than me. So, sure, yeah, thanks very much. I would like to interrupt you for just one moment, yeah. because um, there is a possibility to ask some questions, and we would like you to ask to uh, put your questions in the chat box so that I can um, interrupt uh, uh, the speech uh, with the question, because some questions will be answered, and I know the, what Ra Rakesh is going to say, so some uh, questions are not necessary to ask. So the chat function you can use. Uh, als je dit in het Nederlands wil opschrijven, een vraag, dan schrijf het gewoon in het Nederlands, dan zullen wij het vertalen, en dan uh, in het Engels. Rakesh, up to you. Great, thank you very much. And uh, Rakesh, if you want me to put uh, questions in the chat, please uh, let me know. Okay. Um, generally, I'm 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 quite dyslexic, so actually reading chat is actually quite uh, reading things quickly doesn't come easy for me. So uh, probably easier. That uh, when there is, I mean, what I can do is I can give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about and what we will get to at the end. And then there is a full time at the end where there is a whole question and answer session anyway. But we'll kind of start off with uh, looking at, you know, one of the primary uh, uses for biochar is soil improvement. And so we'll spend a bit of time looking at that. What is soil and how to different ways that people have tried to improve it and what is, um, yeah, and how we can use biochar. So we'll look at, and we'll look at a few other uses of how we can use biochar. And then we'll have a, a break. And then after the break, we'll then look at how do we make biochar. So oh. different ways we can make, um, yeah, it's not just make biochar, but be a bit more creative. How can we also stack functions and do other things with it? And we can explore different uses of, and yeah, and different ways of, of making it. So that's, 
roughly what we will cover. And maybe, uh, maybe uh, Rakesh, it's nice to that Rakesh is also DJ. And uh -huh. uh, all the time nowadays uh, stuck before the computer, uh, he offered to uh, give a dance session after the uh, webinar. Yeah? So that okay. I really look forward to that myself. <laughs> I'm, and I also offered to do play some music in the break, but I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. Um, so maybe that part might not be so easy, but I've got my my vinyl decks and everything. They're just, just sitting here. I've got all my records and everything ready for afterwards. Uh, oops, sorry, can I just... Yeah, so we'll... For sure, the after party, that's easy. That's no problem. But the, the break, the music during the break, I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen. Oh, we'll find another solution. We'll, we'll play that one by ear. Um, so forgive me if I, if I don't get that part working. But at the end, that's no problem. That's sorted. So, yeah, just to kind of um, conclude a bit of the, the introduction. So I used to... By the way, I'm, I don't know, is it on my side? But I'm hearing people come and... Go, which I don't normally get on Zoom. Uh, so every time someone enters, I hear a, a ping. Yeah, some people are still. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's because I'm, I'm on a new version of Zoom, which is always dangerous. All right, um, guys, we need to a co-host. That's why you can hear this, like us. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, it's just I'm not used. It's it's a little bit distracting to to keep hearing people pinging, 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 pinging. Maybe ping. we can add you uh, to be a co-host. Maybe that's fine. Yeah, that, that could be useful because then I mean I, I just need to share. Maybe I'll do one presentation. So otherwise, I don't need to be co-host. Yeah, you can ask us uh, to to make you co-host again when it's indeed. Okay? Great, cool. Thank you very much. So yeah, so uh, yeah, just to add a little bit to that kind of bio. I also uh, started my own eco village out in Croatia uh, many, 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 many years ago. And it was really fascinating to see how uh, the, the two of us who kind of founded that eco village, how we really saw completely eye to eye in everything. And while the two of us worked together, well, it was just the two of us. It was fantastic because you know we basically made a mind map of what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, and then came back together, and it was absolutely identical. So you know, so uh, building houses, yeah, no problem. Growing food, that's easy. Making enough money, that's straightforward. Uh, all the technical stuff, you know, how do we make electricity? We'll figure that out. Don't know yet, but yeah, we can work that out. How to treat grey water and black water? Yeah, we'll figure that out. All these simple, tangible things for both of us, because we're very practical people, was very easy. But uh, the one area that both of us had a big black hole in, and it's really funny that both of us used exactly the same word out of the lack of uh, understanding of the situation. So because we didn't have the vocabulary, we both said the one area we know nothing about is conflict resolution. So, so that's why then, when I realized that was my Achilles heel to creating an eco village, that's why I then went off to start studying, you know, whatever, anything to do with community, bringing people together. And so pretty much all of my courses now that, you know, when we come to have people coming together and living together for a while, really put that kind of social side of the social element together. So, so yeah, so I teach community building. I also teach eco village design education courses, which I'm sure you all familiar with and um yeah so there's a whole and so the, the key areas okay i've always been practical uh, i grew up in a very poor family so we always had to if we wanted something we had to either make it ourselves if it broke we had to fix it ourselves and so we've always had that kind of practical so the practical side of an eco village straightforward but it was the people side that i really had to learn and so that's that's something that i've really now specialized in as um monique said is including sociocracy and all kinds of things and um yeah so that's kind of my background so very very practical hands-on growing food easy building houses easy all that kind of stuff and then i had to learn about the people side of things so when it came to things like biochar 
uh, quite literally, I just needed someone just to explain it to me in, in five minutes, what it is and how it works and bang, right? My head's going uh, and I, I worked it out. So basically, um, the way that I work, the way that I think is I don't think in recipes. So I don't think you do this followed by that, followed by this, followed by that, and then you'll get this result. I think in patterns. So when people ask me, how do I build a biochar cook stove? I give them functionality. I give them science. I give them, you know, flows rather than here, you get this machine, this piece, this component, this size, that you drill a hole this size and you just screw this in, do that. That for me doesn't work because there's a million ways you can do it. And if you look on some of my websites, you'll probably see there's about 40 different styles of biochar burners that I've just photographed. I've made probably more, but 40 different styles that I've presented in, um, in various websites and things because it's, uh, it's all about flow and it's also about whatever you're working with, whatever materials you have. So that's, this is kind of where I want to get everyone to by the end of this is to understand the science behind how to make it so that you can, so you can then pick the right tools, the right materials to actually be able to make it yourself. So um, as I say, one of the first areas of, uh, one of the primary uses of biochar is in soil improvement. We'll look at a few other uses afterwards. So we had a few Mentimeter questions set up. Do you guys have those ready? Um, yeah, I can, I can put it in the chat now. Yeah. Because so do you want to maybe start with that first? Yeah. Uh, the first one is, the first question is, uh, how much do you know about improving the soil? And so I, the idea of these questions is really just for me to gain an appreciation of where you're coming from. Uh, you know, what, what kind of level? Are we talking about people who know everything about food growing and soil improvement, in which case I can skip a whole bunch of stuff? Or are we starting, you know, with people who, what soil, you know, where, where, where are we starting with? Yeah, the screen now that you can see it. So everybody is invited to go to the chat and fill in the questionnaire uh, on the Mentimeter, just to have an idea how, uh, how is the skill and knowledge about improving the soil. Right. Okay. So, so five people filled it in. We are with 26 now. So some people are still maybe looking at it, but you get an impression, uh, Rakesh. Mm -hmm. so, so far, no one who knows nothing about soil. So it's medium. Yeah. One expert. Hey. <laughs> cool. Who's that? Maybe I might draw on some of your experience, whoever you are. Yeah. That would be interesting to know. No? <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. So the majority are competent or at least know something, which is good. So you, do you want to put the, the second question also now? Yeah, maybe let's go for the second question also. Okay. Just, um, so. so how much do you know about biochar? So, yeah, what kind of level are we starting at in terms of biochar? Uh, I, I put the next link in the chat and then uh, you can fill it in again. Mm, I share the screen again. Let me see. How much do you know about biochar? <clears throat> Nobody filled it in yet. Ah, mm -hmm. heard of it. Okay, that's a good start. <laughs> again, I can fill it in too. Uh huh. Ooh, someone makes their own. Someone nothing. Brilliant. All right. There's a few who know nothing. Good start.
Okay, so at least many people have heard of it. Or, yeah, but not so many who know what it is, how to use it, and or actually use it already. Brilliant. Okay, that's good to know. Wonderful. So, all right, so if, if biochar is a, a soil improvement, I guess the first place to start with is, well, what is soil? Um, so yeah, so, so what, what, what is soil and what does good soil look like? What, what's the components? And this is, you can unmute yourself and just shout it out or type it in the chat. And then maybe Monique or Marion or someone can shout it out at me, especially if it's in Dutch, if you type in Dutch. So what, what does good soil look like? What's the components of good soil? I think it's it's very dark. <laughs> okay, why dark? What's what? What is it? What, why? Yeah, why dark? I'm not sure. Okay, no problem. Because of the carbon, I think. Okay, so. Good quality soil basically has life in it. So when you have lots of life, i.e. bacteria, insects, and all kinds of things, all of them eat and they poop and they eat and they poop and they take organic matter that's on top of the soil and they'll eat that and they'll poop that out. Other bacteria will come and eat and poop that and eat and poop. And this uh, continuous chain of interactions between different insects and bacteria, and eating and pooping and eating and pooping is what creates this soil so or good quality soil once you so so basically once you've got this network of different animals and insects and bacteria and things uh, because they keep cycling things through the system they make the soil alive what else do they do to the soil? What, what, what might it kind of feel like, look like? What else needs to be in there? It's not just the life. The life is an important component, and that's what ultimately makes it dark, I should also say. I think there should be also air inside. Exactly. There needs to be air. And with all these insects and things moving around, eating and chomping and eating and chomping, they will make those air gaps. So what can then exploit that air? What can make use? What, what passes through that, those air gaps as well, apart from air, obviously? Water. Water, very important. And your plant roots. Yeah, root. I would say roots. Exactly, your plant roots. So, um, so the harder the soil is, the more difficult it is for plant roots to move through. So the more aerated it is, the softer it is, the easier it becomes for, for your roots to move through and for things to grow. And the more life that's in there, the more it cycles and brings down nutrients and things, the more your plants can really grow. So, um, so if we want to be if the, the aim is to create soils that are really rich and really vibrant, there are certain components that we need in soil. We need, as, as you have pointed out, we need it to be aerated. We need, uh, and so by aerated, meaning pl a place for air to move through, for water to move through, for root, uh, plant roots to go through. We need nutrients in the soil. And so one of the ways that nutrients can come into the soil is whatever organic matter we have on top, that breaks down with, you know, the bacteria breaks that down, the worms come and eat it and pull it back down into the soil. And they kind of make this, this chain to kind of create the, the yeah, create this rich soil. So we need nutrients, we need um, uh, air, we need nutrients, and we need water to be able to pass through but not necessarily to uh, stay there in terms of as um, flooding, but it needs to be moist, uh, but not 
flooded. Otherwise, well, I mean, you can grow things in flooded soil as well. There's, there's plenty of things that are marginal plants that I'm sure you in the Netherlands know all about. Uh, yeah, flooded water and, and what you can and can't do with it. There's plenty, plenty, plenty of plants that will grow in water and many, many, many of which are edible. So we can make use of that. Um, yeah, so we need air, we need nutrients, we need water. And in order to help all of that happen, we need a life. So these are the main basic components. So what biochar is, um, in fact, yeah, let's, let's maybe have a look at a few different ways in which, um, in fact, yeah, before we get into that, let, let's, let's have a little, uh, if it's okay, maybe a, a, just a five, let's say, yeah, five minute breakout, if that's okay. Um, uh, I'm not sure who's doing it. Is it Monique? Yeah, or? yeah that's, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, so maybe just five minutes to think about if we have, uh, well, what are some of the, the greatest challenges we have now that we've you've kind of heard a little bit a bit about what soil is? What are some of the greatest challenges we have in improving our soils and keeping our soils alive and fertile? What are some of the biggest challenges that we typically face in modern the modern world? So yeah, let's just do that as a breakout. So you have a chance to chat to each other and off you go so just five minutes if that's okay als het goed is heb je een opmerking in je scherm gekregen dat je uitgenodigd wordt in een breakout room dus als je daarop klikt dan kan je daarheen en dan kun je met een paar mensen samen over deze challenge praten Heb je hem gehad, Sonja? Ja. ja. Hallo. Hi. Hi. Ah, jij bent Marian. Of niet? Ja. Ja, jij bent de enige die uh, de microfoon open heeft. Hm. Uh, heb jij zojuist een verzoekje gekregen om naar een breakout room te gaan of niet? Ja, maar oh, is, de, is, dit, het niet, is dit niet die breakout room? Die... Nee, nee. Uh, de host Als je naar uh, onder de ballen kijkt. Hm? Dan zie je, denk ik, breakout rooms staan. En dan is daar de uitnodiging dat je kunt joinen. Marian, wij horen ja. jou in de room er doorheen praten. Dat is heel vreemd. Echt? Ja, wij horen jou op de een van mij op afstand praten. Dus ik weet niet hoe dat kan. <laughs> ik ga even okay. terug naar de room. Oké. Okay. Kijk of dat nu is. Dat is een beetje gek, toch? Ja, dat is heel raar. Ik zit nog niet in de room. Anders ga maar, naar, ga maar in plaats van mij naar room 5. Maar ik, ik zie geen room. Uh, ik, kan, uh, ik weet niet hoe ik... Uh... En Koen, Koen zou ook bij ons komen. Oh ja, 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 ja. join. De iPad van no change.
Right there. Yeah, I just closed the room, so they will be back in 20 seconds. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why, but my... Akash, I will look for music for the break. Yeah, I don't know why, but my volume has just gone really, really, really low. And this has happened a few times before. Give me a second to try and fix this. Ah, there you go. That's why. Okay, should work now. Okay, so just a quick feedback from a few a few groups. Uh, we don't have to cover everything, but what are some of the biggest challenges? The, the, the key thing is really for you to be thinking about it for yourself, but maybe just popcorn one or two ideas about what are some of the biggest challenges we face in terms of keeping our soils rich and alive and yeah, nutritionally rich. Uh, we thought about uh, herbicides and pesticides that mm -hmm. will kill the uh, little life in, in the soil. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Good one. What else? And um, adding organic uh, material by compost or uh, release of, for example, uh, symphetum. Uh -huh. That's more a solution than a problem, but yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, we came out uh, up um, uh, digging the soil, plowing and leaving the soil bare, not covered with plants, but uh, bare soil. Yep, that's probably the one of the major, major ones is for some reason we, we dig the soil, we turn it over, we destroy all this amazing infant life that's in the soil. And then by adding herbicides and pesticides and things, whatever life might be left, then gets uh, frazzled and, and destroyed. So all of those things. So, um, so right. So, so you know, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm sure you will discuss lots of other interesting things as well. But, but it was mainly for you to start thinking uh, and getting into the flow of it. And so there's various ways that we can start solving that. And, um, you know, and different people have used different techniques to do that, including uh, things like uh, um, permaculture. Um, yeah, things like permaculture and you know, um, forest gardening, you know, biodynamics have their, their systems. Um, yeah, there's, you know, and I guess there's, there's different techniques that people can diff use depending on, you know, are they a big scale uh, commercial operation compared to just a kind of back garden organic, you know, just growing a few things for yourself or even an organic farmer or whatever. So that depending on the scale will dictate the kind of different solutions um, that people have already found for trying to do this. Uh, big scale, it becomes quite difficult because when you're working big scale and you're using big industrial machines, you lose that sensitivity to the, to the connection of the soil and the land. And um, because once you start getting smaller and smaller, you notice cycles and patterns. You notice what's happening in nature much more clearly. And so you can adjust things much and fine tune things much more beautifully. And so the smaller scale we start doing things, the easier it actually is to really, really take care of the soil. Um, and I say different people have, tried, have invented various different ways. Permaculture has a whole, well, permaculture is for me, uh, my definition of permaculture is it's, it's just common sense, but in a world where sense is no longer common. So it's just basically pulling together all the good, common sense ideas and putting it into a design process so that we can clearly see this common sense underpinned by by the ethics of permaculture you know so everything should be taking care of the earth as well as taking care of people and ensuring that we have these cyclical processes of continuously enriching the system so and there's a whole bunch of techniques and things that we can use that fit within there then you have more, um, you know, 
more immaculate systems such as forest gardening, you know, again, replicating like a forest edge to think about again, very, very carefully these nutrient cycles, you know, when you're properly designing forest gardens. And I see a lot of people make forest gardens thinking, yeah, I've got this tree, I've put a couple of things underneath it, I've put some comfrey, I've put some of this, I've put some of that, I'm going to call it a forest garden. But they, yeah, very rarely think about the spacing, they very rarely think about the full nutrient cycle. And so you see a lot of forest gardens don't work because people are really arrogant, they think they know what a forest garden is without really having studied nature and how nature works. So they miss so many things out. But in a real, proper, well-designed forest garden, you'll think about the spacing, you'll think about the amount of sunlight, you'll think about the different plants, and you'll think about all the cycles and sub-cycles of you know, the nutrient cycle, the water cycle. You'll be thinking about um, how all the different plants interact with each other to really create this amazing you know, you also have to study um, how nature evolves, how nature grows and where nature wants to go to, you know, from a, a field into a forest. And how, how does it actually do that? And where do you want your forest garden to be in that space? And therefore, what kind of plants, what kind of trees and things do you put in? And so once you get it right, you really have this amazing ecosystem that you can then leave, you know, so for example, my parents' garden, which I designed 11 years ago, they, uh, they lived for four years after I uh, finished, make, or after I made it, and uh, after that it was left empty for pretty much six, seven years. Um, and until I came back uh, due, to, due to COVID, and pretty much I've just ate from this garden for, I get 80% of my food from this garden. So no one touched it for six, seven years. But because it's got this balance right, this continuous cycle of thinking about where nutrients come from and how it cycles back down and feeds the earth, feeds the earth, feeds the earth. And because we're thinking about the water cycles and so on and so forth, it just enriches itself. So, yeah, so thinking about those cycles is, is really important. And uh, one way to kind of ensure that we have this richness is through biochar. Um, you know, so as, as we've said, what good soil should be, it should be well aerated. It should have this continuous supply of nutrients. And in order to facilitate that continuous supply of nutrients, it needs life. It needs bacterias and, and so on and so forth. So. Can anyone imagine what biochar actually looks like? And what, what do we even make biochar from? Does anyone know? Would anyone like to offer something? From wood? <laughs> <No. laughs> <Everybody. laughs> it is black. It's all black. Yeah. <laughs> so that feedback was a little bit too much um but yeah biochar is made from woody material um so imagine if you take a piece of wood a stick a twig a branch or something uh that's still alive it's made up of lots of different components it's made up of um carbon is made up of yeah all kinds of other things all kinds of uh, liquids and, and and so on and so forth um, when you put that into the ground as it is when it's fresh different bacteria will come and start breaking it down so imagine a leaf or imagine a twig a, 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 a cat or a dog or you brush past a, a tree and you knock down a twig and it falls to the floor. Bacteria will start to come and it will start to break that wood down. And it will chomp and chomp and chomp. And then later on, things like fungi will come and that will chomp it down. And so basically, ultimately, long term, 
that will break down until you can't even see that it ever was a twig or a leaf or anything. It just looks like soil. So this is not quite what we want for biochar. Um, what we want is we want something that is going to stay in the ground long term. So if we were to find some kind of way that we could, and, and well, actually going back a little bit of science, there's one element in nature that, uh, or well, actually there's many elements, but in, in terms of um, from a, 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 a piece of wood, there's one part of that that there is no organism that can, it, that can actually break it down once it's in its purest form, and that is carbon. As we know, carbon is one of the strongest materials. You know, carbon compressed and heated, compressed and heated, makes diamonds. One of the toughest, hardest things on this planet. I'm sure those of you who, I'm sure many of you cycle, you know, you know that uh, carbon framed bicycles are some of the, the strongest and most lightweight frames you can get. They're strong, but they're light. Um, you know, carbon is a, yeah, it's a very strong, a very tough material and very, very lightweight. So it's a, it has some very interesting properties. So if we want to make biochar, what we want to do is we want to remove everything that is not carbon. Uh, so that is not, yeah, everything that is not carbon so that we're left with just pure carbon. After the break, we look at how to do this. So just imagine for the time being, taking a stick and somehow removing everything, every single component of that stick that is not carbon. So all you have left is just the carbon molecules. Imagine if you were then to use some kind of electron microscope to look at it, to explore what that might look like. What do you imagine? Or maybe you've seen it, but what do you imagine it might look like? So maybe the first thing you might start thinking was, where would the carbon have been used? Diamond? <laughs> uh, not quite, but it needs a lot of heat uh, to, to turn it into a diamond. Maybe it's More tra than... transparent. Not necessarily. Graphite. Sponge type of uh, material. Say, say again? Sponge type of uh, material. I don't understand that first word, uh, but, but I heard you talk about graphite and. Um... With lots of holes in it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I just didn't understand that first word you used. But yes, I, I knew you were on the right, right lines when I heard you say graphite. Um, yeah, with lots and lots and lots of holes. Because the carbon material was used to make the structure, to make the, the, yeah, the structure through which all the veins would run, the structure around all the cells, the structure of pretty much the whole thing so that um, all the, the liquid stuff could move through. So once you take it out, what you're left with is all these holes, all these pathways these tubes these sacks these holes and um and so you have this really most amazing catacomb this most amazing structure of um of yeah minuscule minute you know uh, microscopic holes in this yeah in this material and um What it looks like in, in terms of as a color is it will be black. So if you imagine when you're burning something, uh, when you burn a piece of wood, if it doesn't burn completely, if it was smoking and it didn't burn completely, you're left with what looks like charcoal. Well, you're left with charcoal, sorry. You are left with charcoal. Um, and this is exactly, it's 99% biochar. And I'll explain the difference between charcoal biochar in a moment. So if you were to take this, in fact, what they say, one gram of this 
biochar, this type of charcoal, has the equivalent surface area. If you were to look inside and look at all the surface area in all these holes and cavities and tubes and things, if you were to map that out, you have the equivalent surface area in one gram of biochar of a tennis court. Imagine that. In just one gram of biochar, you have the surface area the equivalent of a tennis court. So imagine, all right, and this, this material, as I say, there's no plant, there's no bacteria, there's uh, no fungi, there's no nothing that can actually decompose and break down pure carbon. So imagine you put this material, this carbon, which has this huge, 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 huge surface area into the soil, into an environment which nothing can break it down. What do you imagine might happen? You've got a substance that's porous, that has lots of air, lots of holes. Fills, fills up with water. One thing it could be doing is it could be filling up with water. It's got holes, it's porous, it's sucking things in. So it could hold on to water. So if you have, for example, very sandy soil, what's one of the biggest challenges you have in sandy soil? You can hold the water. Whoops. Oh. Actually, do you mind when you speak, uh, muting yourself immediately afterwards, because otherwise we get this uh, crazy uh, feedback loop, um, which I've got headphones in and it's, it's quite distressing, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, so speak, but then please mute yourself straight after so you don't get this, this feedback. That would be amazing. Um, but yeah, uh, so one of the problems you have with um, sandy soil is the water just phew, flushes through and it's gone. So by adding biochar into that, all of a sudden you've got a material that can hold on to and absorb water. What else do you think could manifest? Well, actually what, what might be in the water? What might be suspended in the water itself? Nutrients. Nutrients. Woo so, into this into this biochar now you've got water you've also attracted and soaked up some nutrients what else might you have bacteria and then you've got bacteria that is going to love living in there because you've got nutrients you've got organic matter you've got once it starts propagating bacteria, those pop, you know, there's nothing to, to kind of stop it from growing. It's got lots of surface area in which it can grow. It can just grow and grow and grow and grow. It's got a humongous surface area that it can just expand into. And so you've got a lot of nutrients from sucked into it. And obviously with all the air holes, it can also put air into your soil. So if you have more clay soil, what's one of the biggest challenges you have there? Especially if you're walking on it all the time. Uh, air, I think. Exactly, compaction. And therefore, once you can compact it, it's got no air left in it. And so, again, adding biochar into that, now you've added a substance that, uh, that creates space, uh, that attracts and hold and has air attracts and holds on to water and nutrients and life bacteria. So all the things that we've said that we really need in soils, and you can see it works in both extremes. It works in clay soils. It also works in sandy soils. It does. It, it creates an environment that works for in both of those scenarios. So. Um, how are we doing? Still got five minutes before the break, so it's still on good time. Um, so this is biochar. Biochar is this carbon-like material that, uh, or, or it is pure carbon, uh, which has this huge, huge, huge surface area 
that if we add it to our soils, can reconstitute our soil and create a kind of soil that is really rich and really vibrant for whatever. And because it doesn't decompose, it has the ability to do this. If you keep feeding it nutrients somehow, i.e. if you mulch, put mulch material on top of the soils and there's this continuous supply of nutrients and what have you, it can do this for thousands upon thousands of years. So in the Amazon, uh, what they found, anyone who knows anything about the tropics knows that there's almost no nutrients in the soil because of the bacteria and the rate of, and the, the, the amount of bacteria because of the temperature um, and the humidity, uh, things grow so fast that there is no chance for any, um, any, any plants or organic matter to stay in the soil and break down. And therefore you pretty much have almost no nutrients whatsoever in soil. All of the nutrients are locked up in the actual biomass in the tropics. Whereas in the Amazon, what they found, completely contrary to science or completely contrary to anything that is possible in nature, this dark black soil, terra preta, this black soil, and it's, it's impossible to happen naturally. So what they worked out, what they found out is actually it was the Amazonians who were conditioning and creating this soil by putting what we now call biochar into it. So taking embers and mixing it with compost material, including um, human uh, manure, uh, poop and, and what have you, and breaking it down a lot, you know. And so that oh, generation after generation after generation, 2000 years of doing this, created this insane depth of soil that was so rich and vibrant. And, um, and so this is kind of what, what we're looking to do. This, so this is one major application for biochar is to reverse the destruction that agriculture has done to our soils and completely depleted it of life, of nutrients and air and so on and so forth. And not to mention, you know, all the dust bowls and this, that and the other. So um, we can reverse that trend by using biochar. That's not the only place you can use biochar. Um, so maybe let's let's just throw, does anyone know? We've got how many minutes? We've got one or two minutes left before we take a break. Where else can you use biochar? What other applications could there be? And there's- Do you, want, do you want to question the metameter? Uh, or just like- No, we'll just, just throw it out. Just popcorn. Uh, filtration? For filtration. It's Charcoal. In fact, maybe I can quickly want, uh, explain the difference between biochar, charcoal, and uh, active charcoal even. So charcoal, because very often you want it to, for barbecues and things, you want it to, obviously there's two types. There's you know, one which you're going to draw with, which can be just pure carbon. There's a type which you want to uh, burn again so that you can make barbecues and things. For that type, you actually want to leave some of the volatiles in there because those gases that release are what then uh, burn. Whereas in, so uh, charcoal, if it's for drawing, is pure carbon. If it's for uh, barbecues, has a little bit of the volatile still in there. So you make them in slightly different ways. And whereas biochar doesn't need any. And, um, and if you make it at the purest, 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 purest way, you know, the, the, the scientifically perfect way, then you can uh, call it even activated charcoal. You know, the kind of charcoal that you digest to clean your body, you know, when you have diarrhea or something. Um, so 100% pure carbon is activated charcoal, um, medicinal. Whereas when we make biochar, if we make it at home, it's not guaranteed to be 100%, but you can still use it as activated charcoal. It just costs you nothing compared to however much they charge for it in the shops. Uh, so that's very, very, very slight differences. So yeah, one of the, um, you know, think of any other use that you have for uh, charcoal, 
such as filtration, fantastic. So water filtering or, or whatever, some other uses. What else could we use biochar for? Um, for cleaning the air, but the, the, the earth from um, biochemical and yeah, origin. indeed. So there could be some, yeah, some, some other kind of, again, filtration we're pulling up because, again, it's this porous substance that acts like a sponge. So it absorbs toxins and things and kind of locks them in. Brilliant. Anything else? I've kind of mentioned one. You know, medicinal, you can use it as a kind of, uh, you know, um, yeah, to kind of clean your system. You know, if you've had maybe a bit too much alcohol or something, you poisoned yourself and ch -ch 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 charcoal. Uh, Rakesh, uh -huh. can you uh, use it uh, for fermentation for uh, cleaning? Um, uh, toilets, uh, okay. uh, fishies. So, brilliant. Um, hey, yeah, so I, at first I heard you say fermentation. I was like, wow, you're going to use it for... No, uh, but, but yes, for cleaning uh, bio... Uh, so, so using um, uh, biochar in um, as part of your hue manure system. Absolutely. So taking human poop, because think about it, what will it do? You've got this kind of slightly wet, soggy kind of material in your poop, which is full of toxins. You add biochar to it. So what will it do to it? It'll help to dry it out. It'll help to absorb the minerals. It'll help to dry it out. It'll help to aerate it. And once it's aerated, uh, it can dry much quicker. And therefore, yeah, so absolutely. You can also use it for um urine uh for you know um, yeah for absorbing urine and, and quite literally there are hundreds and i mean hundreds of uses you know so people use it for putting into walls to make coolers you know because again because it's porous so you can have this heat differential between two sides and you splash it with water so on one side you may have heat and then because it's absorbing the water when the water absorbs, it cools. So the other surface remains cool. So um, literally, it's down to your imagination. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications of biochar. And last thing before we take the break is just to think about what kind of things we could be making biochar from. So we said woody material, and it literally is that any kind of woody material so obviously when we're, we're looking to make a fire people use very heavy dense woods for making some kind of a fire because it will burn much longer whereas with biochar that's not the end goal we can use anything as if it's got carbon in it we can use it so I've done it with pine cones. I've done it with um, uh, bramble, uh, you know, so just drying uh, black currant, um, uh, sorry, blackberry branches, cutting that up, making that into biochar. I've used um, uh, different types of hard seeds and things, which, you know, like cherry seeds. I have billions of cherry seeds from my cherry trees. What do I do with them? Make it into biochar um literally any scrap uh, what you would imagine is completely unusable for a, a normal fire anything you've got you can make biochar from so and we'll look at how to do that after the break um rakesh i have rajasthan reggae uh -huh. ready you like it I've never heard of Rajasthan reggae, but yeah, okay. go for it. For the break? Okay. Yeah, let's go for it. I did actually have a playlist, but um, ah, you, yeah, no well, problem. But I, I don't have it ready. I don't have it ready. So. Okay. Uh, so shall I share that one then? Go for it. So yeah, so this is your opportunity to get up and dance and move, go to the toilet, get something to drink, whatever you need to do, just go and enjoy. Mm. 
So hi Rakesh, ah, you're plugging in your ears. There was a good question uh, from Tineke Rakesh. Um, she was asking if biochar is, uh, is possible to use as building material, such as a building material in walls. And if so, is it possible to block um, radiation like Wi-Fi or electrical? Yeah, it, it does. Can you explain that to us? Oh, your phone is muted, uh, Rakesh. Yeah. Okay. You can you hear me now? Cool. So um, I don't know the science behind using biochar for making uh, UV or yeah, um, electromagnetic, um, I don't know, uh, blockage. I, I don't, don't even know the, what, what the right word is for it. But I know that it, there's a lot of people who are experimenting with things like that. And in using it for walls, the, the main uses I've seen for it is in very hot climates because it's porous. Okay, you, if you go to India, for example, you'll see people use it all the time there. It's, it's an ancient trick. It's not something that's just, you know, biochar has just come up. It's, um, they've been using it for thousands of years uh, for uh, putting into their cob material. Uh, because it's porous, it's um, it's again, you know, it, and it's it, you know, it expands. So actually, adding it to it makes a really good uh, finish. For example, so you know, like with a lot of the cob um, buildings, if you don't get the clay to sand ratio right, it cracks very easily. You know, very common. I've seen it more or less every eco village I've been to. <laughs> People very rarely get it right, and and that's that's part of the fun. That's part of the game but once you start adding things like biochar into there because it is expandable because it is porous and because it can be very very fine or it can be very coarse uh, it really acts as a really good filler and um and so yes yeah, so in india what they do is they in particular they use this as the last final uh coating on um on their cob structures and you know um you go to the villages, the seasonal workers, they will quite literally, uh, straight after the monsoons finish, they'll get some cane, they'll build a structure, they'll cob it in with just mud, do, 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 and then finish it off with this. Um, and it's a, it's a home that, that lasts through, you know, while they're working on the fields. And then uh, when the monsoons come back again, they'll collapse them down, let the, everything return back to earth, um and off they go and go back to wherever else they want to live so it's um and the, the advantage of the having it in the walls is because it's porous it allows air through so your houses breathe um but it can also um as I say if you splash water onto it as the water evaporates it creates this kind of cooling system so you can actually cool your systems. In fact, some people make like refrigerators from it. In exactly. So if you're familiar with like a cool grade E safe, you know, um, they can make something, you know, which also uses Hessian. But in this case, you could do something very, very similar with biochar, a kind of biochar cob wall. So yeah, lots and lots and lots of really imaginative uses for biochar. Good question. Thank you. So, okay, um, quick recap. What is biochar? Simple words, what is biochar? Filtrator. That's what you can do with it, but what actually is it? That's one of its uses. Structure. Non-organic, non-organic uh, material from wood. Great. So a combination of both of those is basically it's um, it came from wood and it's removing all of the organic material, everything that is non-carbon. So it just leaves behind this carbon structure. So, yeah, between the both of you, 
munch your answers together perfect um so yeah so it's it's basically it's just pure carbon and importantly it's all the organic matter that was in that woody material taken out so what we want to do and I generally tend not to do slideshows, but at the moment I've got a frozen shoulder, so I can't actually draw properly. I can't actually get my right my drawing hand kind of above my chest height, so it's a little bit difficult for me to draw today. Um, so I do have a slide presentation. Um, hopefully, I can still keep it alive and won't bore you to death with slight, you know, death by PowerPoint. Um, so let's have a go. Uh, da -da -da -da. So making biochar. So yeah, so there's lots and lots and lots and lots of different ways to make biochar. But if you imagine what we're trying to do, the key thing we're trying to do is we're just trying to find a way that we can take all of the non-carbon uh, materials out of the actual woody material. So one easy way to do that is by making it hot. So if we heat up wood, what will it do? So if we put a piece of wood into something that is in incredibly hot, you know, like 500 or even 200 to 1000 degrees centigrade, what's going to happen? So I'm not talking about fire yet, but if we put it into something hot, what will happen to the wood? It will burst into flame. It depends. What what does uh, what what components need to be there in order for it to burst into flames? There's certain chemicals, certain things that need to be there. Oxygen. Oxygen. What's actually burning? The oxygen isn't burning. The oxygen is fueling. The is is fanning. What's actually burning? gas so where does the gas come from you know when, when a component when a piece of wood burns where does the gas actually come from the organic compounds exactly so it's the so i'm hearing someone else listening to something else in the background you can maybe mute um thanks so yeah so exactly uh, the um the gas is actually the when the wood itself heats up, it all the molecules vibrate, they become hotter, they vibrate, they become lighter, and they become a gas. So they release as a gas. So if you mix this gas with some oxygen, and there's one more thing that you need in order for it to actually combust. What's the last thing you need? Is you need some kind of a spark. You need some kind of a, something to ignite it. So once you've got those, some, uh, now you've got a flame. Um, but basically, if you think about it, what you're doing by heating the wood up is you're releasing all of the non-carbon materials, you're releasing all the volatiles, all the organic you know, the, the, the waters, the everything that is not carbon, because of this insane heat that you're putting it on, in, into, it's releasing all of those. And how do we see it? When, when we see this, we can actually see this gas. But how do we see it? Smoke. Smoke. Exactly. Because it contains other, it contains so many particles that it's not of this clear gas is this it's smoke so um so there's lots of ways that we can make biochar but effectively what we want to do is we want to heat it up to such a degree that it releases all of this uh all of this material all of the, the gases or it turns all the everything that is solid into a gas and it releases out of the system but that gas contains a lot of uh, carbon materials as well 
And so from an environmental perspective, if you are releasing smoke into the air, this is incredibly environmentally unfriendly. This is a big part of the, um, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, the negative cycle of uh, uh, carbon, yeah, putting carbon into the air. It's a really significant element of it. So knowing that this is a gas, if we were to somehow ignite it, so we've got a gas, if we mix it with oxygen, and we put some kind of a starter, bang, we can be burning the gas. And actually, if you look very, very carefully at wood when it burns, you'll see that the flame never, ever, ever touches the wood. So the wood is, so to say that wood is burning is actually technically incorrect. It's the gas that's releasing from the wood that is always burning. Look at it. Next time you look at an open fire, you'll see it. You'll see. Uh, you'll see there's this gap. Sometimes it might even go a little bit bluish before you then get the, the kind of reddish, yellowish flame. Um, because it's the gas that's burning, not the wood itself. So we can use this. Um, so let's imagine uh, the most simple, simple, simple uh, biochar burner. And all right, so there's different ways that we can make biochar, as I say. I've got at least 40, 50 different ways that I've made it. Um, most of the projects I have, because I'm not uh, a welder, I'm not an engineer, is I don't, and I don't have access to welding machines. I don't make mine to a scientific or to a, an engineering kind of quality. So I make mine with just whatever materials I have and using whatever primitive tools I might have. So for example, in India once, we the only tools we had is we had a broken screwdriver and we had a stone. And then we had the various metal parts and we literally made the whole thing with just those. Um, so if you want to make, you know, we can look a little bit later about how one of the questions was, could we capture the gas to use it afterwards? Yes, you can, but if you do it at a very, 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 very good, uh, high standard of engineering. But the kind of basic stuff that I make, it's, it's very difficult to capture that gas. And we'll, we'll look and explore why that is in a moment. So imagine taking two barrels. So two metal barrels, uh, which have obviously the sides intact and one side complete and a big hole in the other. So an empty barrel um with no no lid and one which is smaller that can go inside the other with enough gap either side of it imagine if we come to this one imagine if we were to put wood woody material onto the inside so as you can see this barrel is upside down so at the bottom here this is open and so we've turned it upside down and we put woody material in here if we then also put woody material on the outside, imagine for a second that this air hole doesn't exist. So take these air holes out for the time being. Imagine that doesn't exist. Imagine if we were to light this woody material on the outside. Um, and let's see, do I have some pictures of... Yeah, so a barrel on the inside, which is full of woody material, and then start filling with woody material on the outside. If you start lighting this, what's going to happen? So this is nice, dry, woody material. You've, you've set that alight. What do you think is going to happen? Imagine there's no air holes here. It's getting very hot. Only the top will burn. Uh-huh. Exactly, only the top will burn and then eventually burnt out. It will go out. It will start and before that it will start to smoke. Oh yeah. Nice. Like crazy. And why is it going out? Because it doesn't get to air. Because it doesn't have enough oxygen, exactly. So once you set it alight, 
the oxygen is being burnt, is being used, consumed. And because you've set it alight at the top, and this is a vacuum underneath, if it has no air holes, so it's used up all the oxygen, and so therefore it can't fuel itself with more oxygen, and therefore eventually it goes out, but it will smoke quite in intensely before it goes out. And that smoke is basically because the, the wood is still very, very hot from the flame. It's still releasing the gases, but because it's got no oxygen, it can't combust, and therefore you have no flame. Bingo. So imagine we put air holes into here. Now, what's the difference? It will all burn. Now we will have a nice steady burn because now we have oxygen coming through the system to keep it burning. Exactly. It works as a chimney? Not exactly, but later on we can put a chimney onto it. Uh, not, not at this moment. Though it is, well, in, actually, maybe in a way it is because if you think about it what's going on here is this is becoming devoid you've got a fire on top this is becoming it's sucking all the uh, oxygen or it's consuming all the oxygen therefore there's a vacuum and therefore it sucks the air in because there's a vacuum there's a shortage of oxygen in here as it's being consumed it therefore drags the oxygen in through the air holes so in a way yeah so that's why you have this nice steady kind of burn. Um, what about in here? What's going on here? So here you have a barrel that is full of woody material. The only air gap might be at the very bottom, unless you seal this, which you don't. You could optionally also put a couple of little air holes in here as well. Another alternative way to do this is if you have a barrel that has a lid, is you and to be honest it's actually easier if you do you fill it you, you know because obviously as you can see here what you're doing is you're having to turn it upside down so you fill it you put the lid on you tighten it you put it inside but then you must 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 have air holes at the side otherwise it will explode so you must have air holes inside but imagine in this scenario where somehow we've managed to juggle you know we're really clever we've kind of taken this barrel and somehow we've turned it upside down without losing all the material that's in it and then you've got this insane flame outside and because you're pumping this oxygen in it's much 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 hotter than an open flame you'll get this to about a thousand degree well 600 700 degrees centigrade for sure and then if we add one more component to it we can actually get it up to about a thousand degrees centigrade so you've got this insane heat all the way around but inside here you don't what what are you missing inside here what isn't in here fire why is there no fire what's it missing that it needs to have the flame oxygen oxygen exactly initially it might have some oxygen but that will get consumed very, very quickly. Um, and there's also no spark, because remember, we start the flame at the top. We haven't started a flame here, so that this doesn't ever combust. But what does happen? You've got this insane heat on this carbon material. I think the gases will separate from the gar carbon. Exactly. Exactly. So all the non-carbon particles will escape. Now, where can they escape from? This is a solid barrel. The only place is either at the bottom or if you have a hole in here, that's the only place that it can escape from. Correct? Yeah, it's going to circle around in here and it's going to produce so much that it can't go anywhere else. So the only place it can come is out through here. So when it comes out through here, because it's hot, which way is it going to go? Is it going to go up or down? Up. It's going to rise. It's, you know, it's going to rise. And when it gets to here, what does it hit? What's here? Fire. Fire. 
So now, what have you done? You've just fed the uh, fire with gas. Simple, huh? So that's what keeps it going. So can you see how the material on the inside has never ever touched a flame, but all of the organic matter, all of the what we call volatiles, all the non-carbon uh, particles have been released. So in this scenario, what you're doing effectively, and so that, therefore that becomes a biochar. What you've done effectively is you've used this as uh, a just a burn material, and you can allow that to burn right the way down to cinder. And so potentially you might even have a little bit of ash, but to be honest, you won't have much because of the, the intensity of the heat. But all of this never ever touches a flame, so it never goes to, to cinder, it never goes to ash, but it becomes biochar. So because I'm a permaculturalist, I don't want to just make biochar for the sake of making biochar. I also want to become a little bit more imaginative and do some other things with it. So I also want to cook with it. So one thing we can do is we can add a, um, a chimney onto it. And that chimney, because of the, um, because obviously as the flame just wants to go upwards, now that you're concentrating that, yeah, it wants to just go straight up, but all of a sudden you've, 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 you've stopped it from just going up at the rate it wants to, and you've concentrated it. So that actually speeds up the rate at which the, um, yeah, the gas is escaping. And therefore, you've created a chimney, which will suck even more air in here. And therefore, the intensity of the flame will be much stronger. So this is how you now get it up to about 1,000 degrees centigrade. You could put some kind of a pot, because what you'll have is you'll have a mad flame up here. And you could put a pot on top of this and cook directly onto it. Or you could put something here. Um, and obviously, if you're going to do something here, I would advise doing something in cast iron with a very, 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 very good fitting lid. Uh, because you'll have a lot of yeah, particles flying around. So it has to have a really good fitting lid, solid cast iron, maybe even baked potatoes or something, um, you know, in tin foil or whatever, whatever, whatever. But anyway, there's, there's a few options you have there. So these are, this is just one example. So this is a, I don't know, 200 litre barrel and a 40, 50 litre barrel. Um, in this particular case, because this, this barrel actually was already being used for another project, so it already had holes in the bottom, which is not ideal, but that's what I had in this particular case. But this one, as we saw, has no holes, but also it could be one which has a lid, in which case you then absolutely must make holes here because you absolutely must allow that oxygen to escape, otherwise, you will have an explosion. So, and then you can make some kind of a chimney. Uh, and so this is it. So this is me using, uh, that's just bramble, uh, meaning, you know, um, uh, black berries. So, uh, yeah. Bramen, so, bramen in, in Dutch. Uh -huh, thank you very much. So something that for many people, if they've got it, it's like a pain. What do I do with all of this? Turn it into biochar. Uh, you fill the barrel with it. Sorry, I didn't take a photograph. And boom, 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 boom. Simple. And there we go, having it burning. And so that's the, yeah, with the chimney. You can't actually see the flame in this particular case. And eventually, once it's burnt all the way down, you're just left with a little bit of ash and a little bit of biochar. And then bingo, here's your biochar. So this is it coming out. This is just a cross section. And this is it crushed. Okay, so that's one system. Another system, and I think I'll just cover two systems. How, how are we doing for time, by the way? I can't really see a clock. It's nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, and we go till half past nine, yeah? So maybe 10 more minutes on this and then questions and answers, I think. So um, 
this is a second way of doing it. And to be honest, this is the most common way that I do it is again, you take a barrel, a smaller barrel. So just a 30, 35 liter or something like that. And I'll make holes in the bottom typically, but you can make it in the side. It's not that you have, must make it at the bottom. You can make it the side as well. You fill that with woody material. And, uh, and in this system, you set fire to the top. And in the same way, uh, the reason for having the holes is so that you can get a primary flow of air coming through the bottom. But then what you want to do is you then want to reduce the air uh, because you don't want too much. So typically what I'll do is I will put this first of all, I'll put a stick on the floor and I'll put this barrel on top of the stick so that there is a lot more air than can come through. And then once I want to reduce the oxygen, I pull the stick away. So this then sits flush on the floor. You'll still get some air coming through, which is still necessary, but um, I'll explain why um, in a moment. Uh, so yes, yeah, so while a small amount of air does come through, what you really want is I really want the oxygen coming in from the top. So if I can allow oxygen to come in from the top, that means that the fire will be here. Because once this has run out of oxygen, then, um, uh, you know, then this will stop burning. But once it starts sucking oxygen in here, the fire, the flame, you know, so this will release the gas, this will inject the air and therefore you'll have a flame here. To make that much faster, if I put another piece of metal around the actual whole structure in such a way the oxygen can come in from the uh, bottom, it can rise and then come in. Think about it. This is three, four, five, six hundred degrees centigrade. So what's the air going to do here? The air, outside air temperature, maybe whatever, 20, 30 degrees centigrade. This is, a, you know, four, 500, 600 degrees centigrade. What's going to happen to the hair, air here between the two barrels? It will heat up. And therefore, what does hot air do? What does hot air do? Rising faster. It rises. So. You've actually, even before uh, there's a vacuum in here, you've already started to create uh, warm air coming upwards and coming in by doing it this way. So, so yeah, so basically it's very, very simple. You have the woody material in here, you set it alight. Once you see that the, it really is a light and it's not gonna go out, you put this top, a uh, barrel on top, which has a chimney on it as well. And the oxygen starts coming in up here and you have an intense flame here. And again, because you're concentrating it, you really have an in insanely intense flame going on. And here again, you can see that is my attempt at trying to draw a flame. Um, in which case you can then put a pot on top of that and you've got this mad crazy flame that's heating your food. So these are, again, a simple example. Again, it's just materials that we just happen to find lying around this particular farm. So that's the burn chamber with air holes here to allow the oxygen in. Uh, this is the thing that we put on top of it. And in this particular case, it just happens to be that this is uh, a centimeter or two shorter than here. So it's perfect. We didn't need to put holes in here because it uh, didn't touch the ground. So it let the air in from the bottom and da, 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 da. And there, I don't know if you can see that, but me, this is in the way. Can I move that out of the way? Come on, go, there we go. So let me go back again. There you can see this insane, intense flame that's coming out of it. And, uh, you know, sometimes that can be like, <laughs> a crazy two meter high flame if you depending on what kind of wood you use and uh the, the the width of your chimney depending on how you get your chimney working um 
So typically we then put this kind of pop stand on there. If you can see carefully, we put some rebar through there so you can then put a pot into it. And in this particular case, I remember we were cooking for 30 people. And so we got this big, huge pot full of, I don't know, must have been 20, 30 liters of water and cooking beans. They put it on there. And within five minutes, this thing was boiling over because they already put the beans in. The beans were frothing over like crazy. And people were just going mad because they couldn't get it off quick enough. They, they, they didn't imagine that it would burn and it would be able to boil 30 litres of water in less than five minutes. And uh, yes, yeah, so they were going crazy trying to figure out how to get this, this pot off without, um, yeah, without the right equipment. So it was... It was I think maybe we got a video of it. It's quite hilarious watching. Um, and these yeah. are some other simple examples of the same kind of way of doing it. So let's stop that there. Cool. There are a few questions, uh, Rakesh. Perfect timing. So go for it. Uh, yeah. Well, of course, the uh, material material you want to burn must have must be dry. Not necessarily. Oh, not necessarily. No, I've done it many times with uh, wet, with fresh green wood. Okay, thank you. So that was the perfect answer for the first question. And um, also, can you make biochar in a rocket stove, mass heater? Is that possible? Okay, so with a rocket mass heater, um, what you could do, and it's what you what what you would need to do is you would need to put the flame out at a certain point, and uh, so uh, so yes, you can do it, but with this system, it kind of burns out, and then once once the flame has gone, you then douse it in water or or whatever to put it out, um, and it's easy to move. But with a, a rocket mass heater, which is typically kind of built into your house, it's much more difficult. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to find some way, and again, it just takes a little bit of engineering to work out how to do this. You need some way, because if you see in a rocket heater, uh, what, what eventually happens is uh, the wood will burn until all the gases have gone, and then it will continue and it will become ash. It will continue. So what you need to do is once all of the and especially if you've got like a self feeding mechanism. So this will burn, you know, so this is the, the dry wood. It's going in here. The flame is here at the bottom. This will burn and, you know, this will start to dry out. And so that will burn and it will get to the point where it's ash and then it drops in. It will burn until it goes to ash and it drops in. And so very difficult to stop it from burning and and, and take it out at the point where it is all the gases have escaped and it's just charcoal it's just biochar so what you need to do is maybe use um uh yeah smaller pieces without self-feeding it and kind of and it's, it's tricky it, it, it takes skill because <laughs> you're going to need to work out well when is it ready and then pull it out and then douse it but you don't want to take all of them out because then you've lost the actual fire. So it's a case of juggling. So it's not so easy to retrofit. What you might want to do is if you can get the engineering, if I'm, I'm thinking this on the, on the fly now, is if there is some way, instead of having the instead of having the actual uh, rocket stove actually directly burning the wood, if you could somehow, and I, yeah, actually I need to think about this from an engineering perspective, it's, but it's not straightforward. But what you want to be doing is instead of burning the wood, you want to be releasing the gas and then burning the gas. So, um, I would have to draw that out to try and work that out there, there, there's, that's a nice challenge that's a nice challenge um it's not straightforward though it's not straightforward and i, I yeah i'd need time to think about that but nice challenge 
I'll, I'll have a good think. And there's another question, uh, Rakesh. Mm -hmm. There's a ceramist among us, and uh, she's uh -huh. asking about the temperature where you can put the cooking uh, stove or the or maybe something to make a, make a pot or something. Is it heat enough? So um, every person who does pottery that I've met who tells me that I've asked them this question. I've asked them what I think should be quite a straightforward question that they should answer, but none of them have ever been able to answer me this. And that is, and maybe someone here can answer me this. Well, in order for me to make something like this I, uh, to become a, you know, for pottery, for making pottery, what I need to know is what temperature do you need it to be at and for how long? And they gave me such wishy-washy answers that, well, I can't work with that. So if you can ask me that, then I can tell you whether you can do it or not. Well, I can read in the chat that we need 1200 Celsius degree. I've seen it get up to a thousand degrees centigrade. I've, uh, but that's the only reason, and out of the 50, 60 that I've made, it just so happened that this one person at this particular place had a, an electronic kind of thermometer and his thing went up to a thousand degrees centigrade and we blew his thing oops but luckily he was an engineer he fixed it it took him a day but he he sorted it and he fixed it but he blew it because it went over a thousand degrees centigrade um so all i can guarantee is that on this one occasion it went up to a thousand degrees centigrade i can't honestly tell you that it goes higher than that um yeah um maybe we can look it up one thing with me is i'm being dyslexic i really struggle to read and i really struggle to get information from the internet from from places uh, i study i learn things myself because i so while that information may be out there somewhere i don't really have access to it so everything i know i know because i've done it i've tried it i've worked it out for myself um so yeah so maybe that information is there somewhere but i just don't have access to it but the other thing is then the duration how long do you need so i can get it to a thousand degrees for sure but for how long do you need it to make ceramics my what, what i imagine i could do i imagine that i could have maybe two burners or something i can then have the escape chimney going through some kind of like a cob oven or you know like a pizza oven type shape environment uh so that i can be putting this insane heat into there and when one goes out i can start the other when that goes out i can start the other so that i can maintain some kind of temperature uh so if someone was to ask me to make a kiln for pottery that's how I would approach doing it. But again, I need to know how long do you need it for? <laughs> what I can tell you is uh, I, was, I did one project. Uh, we were making it in, um, in Italy with a guy who is, has a well, he, he is a welder. So he has his own business with all this, all the equipment. But it wasn't where we lived. It was somewhere. It wasn't where we were doing the course. It was somewhere else. And he didn't speak one word of English. He was Italian. And uh, I didn't speak one word of Italian. Well, not enough. So somehow through just, you know, a little bit of English, a little bit of Italian and some drawings, we kind of, I kind of explained a biochar burner to him. And he got very, very excited. And then he came back with this monster. He came back with this, I don't know, a thousand litre metal chamber. You know, uh, and yeah, if you're uh, three meters tall, maybe you could cook on that. You know, it was like, uh, it was huge. Uh, this huge monster. I, I'll see if I can find some pictures of it. And um, well, actually it wasn't that huge. It was maybe, maybe two meters um, or meter 80, something like that. But um, basically it was going, it was burning for seven hours 
until eventually we said, look, we need to go to sleep. We need to put this thing out. It was, I mean, wow. It, it, and it made so much biochar uh, in one go. It was um, insane. <laughs> That's all I can say. Any other questions? Because this is actually the question and answer time. Uh -huh. um, um, have you noticed that um, the smell of the process will change uh, by the time you need to stop the process? You, you, the line was very, very broken. Did you say, do I notice a difference in smell? Did anyone else catch it? Yeah. Yes, he said the difference in smell. If once uh, the gas is gone, if if it gets a different smell, I wouldn't say smell, but you can see that um, smell it, nose. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say smell, but you can see the difference. What you can see is once the gas is gone. So when um, actually you can hear it also. Because when the, the oxygen is pumping through and the gas is burning, it has this kind of rocket sound. You can hear that very, very clearly. And then later on, uh, it kind of just cools down. And effectively, what's now happening is it's more like a fire fire. And it's now taking the charcoal and, it's, and if you leave it, it will basically turn that charcoal into ash. So once you kind of hear that rocket sound stopping, meaning it's not pumping oxygen in and burning the oxygen. And also the other thing is uh, the, um, the flame should be right, at, depending on the style you're, you're using. If the second style, for example, the flame will be at the top. If you actually look into the uh, cook stove, you'll see because of the air holes at the top, that's where the oxygen is coming in from. And therefore all of the, uh, flame is there. Once you see that flame drop and the flame is down on the, the burn material, you're not burning the gas anymore. So then you know, right, it's time to stop. Time to stop. Douse it in water and stop it. Other questions? There's, there's one other really important fact that I need to also explain to you of how to use it when you're adding it to soil. There's one more really important thing I need to say, but are there other questions first? Uh, yes, about, about the quality of the drum. Uh -huh. If you heat the metal, it will come to rust. Yes. Uh, how long can you use uh, an oil, oil drum? So I've had oil drums, it depends how often you use it and if you obviously leave it into the, in the air. Obviously, if you've got a steel drum, no problem. Uh, but with an, um, a kind of, yeah, uh, a tin or something that, that's going to rust. Um, yeah, a, a normal oil barrel. If you look after it and keep it indoors and stop it from getting too wet, you can keep it going for a couple of years. But then, as you say, it will eventually. Having said that, once I, <laughs> in India, uh, we, we went and got some scrap uh, metal to make, make it there. It got so hot, it just burnt a hole straight through it. But that's because of the quality of the metal that we chose. <laughs> so it got so hot, it just... Like as we were burning it, you could just see this whole side just went red hot and then boof, it just fell apart. So, uh, so yeah, it really does depend on the quality of the metal. One, um, and maybe someone might want to translate this into, into Dutch, but one material you shouldn't use is uh, galvanized steel. Um, you know, which is an amount, I'm not sure what the, the scientific technical word is, but it's a combination and amalgam of um, zinc and uh, steel, I guess. I, and I think that it, I think it's called gegalvaniseerd style in okay. Dutch. And the reason why that's dangerous is because in order to glue 
for want of a better description, in order to bond the two materials together, they use very, very, very heavy uh, chemicals. And when you, if you use, if you heat that up, you start releasing those chemicals, which is very, very, very toxic. So one word of warning, avoid using galvanized steel uh, for burn chambers. No. You might might be able to get away with it as, as the outer chamber, maybe, but definitely not the burn chamber. Um, this uh, can you use this also in in the wall um, through the paint or something to keep uh, radi radiation outside? You mean use the biochar yeah. in, in walls for radiation? There's, there's scientific research looking at that. So I'm not a scientist. Uh, I don't even, I, I, basically I never went to school, to be honest. I, I, I tricked the school into thinking I was at school, uh, but I never actually went to any classes. Uh, so I didn't get into trouble with my parents, but I, I did also didn't get any formal education, which is actually to my advantage because I was never brainwashed into thinking their way. But it means I don't totally understand science in the way many people do everything i know is because i've worked it out for myself according to what i need but uh but there are people who are doing scientific research on stuff like that and so it's really worth hunting them down because there's some really fantastic applications of biochar i heard was it maybe wim who was also trying to ask a question there yeah i had a question uh Rakesh. um I can imagine that you can get really enthusiastic about this once you start with it. Did you ever meet people who made too much biochar? Too much biochar? Um, can you make too much or is it just make as much as you can or how do, how do you? I think it's a case of make as much as you can because, and if you see um, most of the ones that I actually make are quite small scale so that I can cook on it. And so every time I'm cooking, I'm making biochar. Stacking functions. and stacking functions um and yeah actually that's another thing we could have also thought, talked about what other functions we could have stacked to it there's a, hundreds of other things we could, could could do with that heat um so if you imagine if you look at the quality of the soil that we have in most of uh the world because of agriculture uh we're in desperate need of enriching those soils if you think about it okay another thing that i didn't say is um if you if i was to take the equivalent amount of wood that would last maybe five minutes in an open fire i can have that burning in a biochar cook stove and in an open fire it will get to maybe 400 degrees centigrade i can put that into a biochar burner a biochar cook stove and have it burning for about 40, 50, maybe even one hour, 60 minutes at, at the beginning for sure, about 1000 degrees centigrade. And then later on, maybe it'll come down to about 700 degrees centigrade. And for 45 minutes to an hour compared to five minutes in an open flame. So I'm getting a very, very, very efficient return of heat compared to you know, the amount of material I'm burning. And also I can be using just scraps. I can be using the tiniest things that no one else will turn in, you know, will try to burn. I can be using that. And so uh, if you imagine 3 million, uh, 3 billion people even on this planet, their only source of cooking and heating is with wood. Their only source of heating and cooking is with wood. So if they're chopping down trees and putting that into an open flame, that's a serious problem. So if we can get them to be using something like a biochar burner, and then you and you know, and putting it in an open flame, every time you as a hippie sit around an open flame, you're putting uh, carbon particulates into the air, you're screwing up this planet. You are part of the problem. Sorry to say that, uh, but you are part of the problem. You're putting carbon particulates into the air, because of the smoke. So instead, if we were to take that smoke and burn it, like we do in a biochar burner, we're burning off the carbon particulates and preventing it from going in the air first. 
And the reason why open air flames are not so efficient is because of the amount of smoke. It's all that unburnt stuff, all the gases that isn't burning, and that's what's being released, you know, with the carbon particulates. Um, whereas once we burn it off, we burn that off, and then we're left with pure carbon, which we can then put back into the ground, and now we're sequestering carbon. So from an environmental perspective, we're making a huge, huge, huge impact if we can be getting people to cook using biochar and sequestering it back into the ground. And so every way you look at it, and it's not just carbon sequestration, they've also noticed there's a lot of, again, someone who's more scientific can do the research and figure it out. It's not for me to really work out, but they say there's all sorts of other gases that also start to get um, reduced, other greenhouse gases, that by sequestering carbon in this way uh, is also having a really positive effect, which they didn't think would happen when they started the trials. Um, I couldn't tell you what they are because that's not how I think. So yeah, you can't make too much. You really can't make too much. So the one, one other really important fact, if I can get this in before I finish, just in case I forget to tell you this, is when you put this onto the soil, if you put it onto the soil, for example, in um, if you put it right now, just as spring is coming and all the things are coming through, if you put biochar directly from your biochar burner, maybe you leave it to cool down a bit, you put it directly in the soil, the biochar has no bacteria in it. It has no moisture in it. What do you think is going to happen if you put it directly onto the soil? It'll suck the water up from the soil. Not just the water, but what else? Uh, nutrients. Nutrients. Uh, and? Bacteria. Bacteria. It acts like a sponge, so it pulls all of these things in. So what get deprived of the water, the bacteria, and the nutrients? your young seedlings. So if you put it directly on the ground, you're actually gonna suffocate and you're actually gonna stress your plants. So you need to do one extra step. You need to charge the bacteria, uh, charge the, the biochar. And there's a hundred different ways of doing this. You can uh, urinate on it. You can, um, if you're making like liquid feeds, you know, from your uh, comfries and things, you can charge it with that. You can put it into your compost and charge it that way. The most, because I was once described as the most productive, lazy hippie anyone's ever met, this particular person's met, because I spend so much time and energy and effort into designing ways that I can be lazy. And so what's the laziest, easiest way, the minimum effort I can put into making biochar and uh, activating my soil? So the minimum effort way of doing that for me is to put it down in autumn. So as soon as it comes out of the biochar, let it cool down, sprinkle it everywhere in the autumn. Why? What, what do you think is going to happen? Compared to if I do it in spring. It'll fill by rain, with rain, water. There's no young things coming through. So it's not going to affect what's already growing. And then over the months, over the winter, the rain, the bacteria, the nutrients can start filling in. So it charges itself over the months. So that's the lazy way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to say you can add nutrients to it. It's called charging your biochar. So look it up. There's a hundred ways to do it. So I need to get that in before we finish because that's... A really essential point. Thank you, Rakesh. One more, one more question. I, okay, I one, more. one, more, one I, more question. So, how much will you uh, mix with the soil? So, if you have normal soil like um, uh, ten kilos, then how much kilos will be uh, this? Very uh, good question. So, if you think about um, what you're actually doing with the biochar, you're kind of almost replacing the kind of organic matter so the non-mineral content of your soils so what percentage of your soil should be organic matter four to five percent 
So anyone who studies soil science uh, will, will see that, yeah, something like four to five percent of your soil is uh, non, you know, so a, a percentage is minerals, you know, uh, sand, salt, uh, sand, clay and silt. A percentage of it is air, a percentage of it is water and a percentage of it is the organic matter. And that's effectively what you're replacing. So that's a, a ballpark figure, a good ballpark figure. Very good question. Okay. Awesome. There was one more question from uh, Rike, but your computer is very slow, eh, Rike, so I will ask it. Can you also use organic textile? Um, what I imagine... I'm trying, to, I'm trying to picture what it looks like. What I would imagine is if you try to burn it in the, the second type scenario, you would end up with nothing. You, it would just burn off. Whereas in the first scenario with the barrel inside, it's worth a try. It's worth a try, especially if it's like jute or hessian or something really solid. If it's a fine kind of um, cotton, not sure. If it's silk, forget it. Uh, but um, yeah, if it's a really good solid jute or hessian or something, I my suspicion is yeah, you probably could. But as I say, but I would use the second type scenario where it's never ever ever touching the flame. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would do it that way. So Rakesh, thank you so much. I will put a question: uh, How it was for you this meeting? in the chat. So I invite you to give feedback to Rakesh and us as organizers, uh, mm -hmm. how it was for you. I think it was uh, really interesting, Rakesh, you motivated me uh, to, to really start doing this uh, instead of uh, being part of the problem, burning wood, becoming part of the solution. And I really look forward to hear about all you guys. I will show the presentation of it in a minute. So thanks so much, Rakesh. And uh, definitely for all the work you are doing, I will share the presentation. Or the, um, I will share now the, uh, what people are sharing. Okay. Can I, while people are typing that out, maybe can I, um, can I also say, if people want to find out more uh, or want to, yeah, um, every 22nd of every month, we do what we call a public skill share under what we call the roots and resilience. So where we talk about biochar, we talk about fermentation, we talk about permaculture, we talk about forest gardening, we talk about plants and, you know, um, Anything, basically anything that people want with the perspective of being vegan. Uh, and most of the people who are part of that project um, align to vegan values. So we don't talk about animal husbandry, keeping chickens, things like that. Um, but anything, you know, it doesn't mean people have to be vegan to be part of it. But everything we talk about is without putting a vegan slant onto it it just happens to be vegan if you see what i mean so it's not an evangelical kind of you must be vegan kind of nonsense uh it just happens to be how do you grow food without you know by using the natural cycles of uh, of nature so if anyone's interested in that i can send you the link uh for the roots and resilience sessions yeah um, please please put it in the chat or we can uh you can also send it to to us to jen and we can spread it to the people, to the right. participants. Yes. And a few other things. The, um, I'm, in a couple of weeks' time, if anyone's interested in learning permaculture, I've got a permaculture course coming up. If anyone's interested in forest gardening, I've also got a forest garden course coming up, uh, all online. And all of my courses are what I call uh, con by conscious contribution, meaning that people pay what they think is fair and what they can afford. So money should never be an obstacle for someone to attend one of my courses. That's how I like to put it. So 
whatever you think is reasonable, whatever you think is fair. So a permaculture design course doesn't have to be the thousand euros that many people charge. You know, if you can only afford 100 euros, 200 euros, 500 euros, whatever you can afford. If you can't even afford that, just talk to me and we'll find another solution. So again, I'll send some links if anyone's interested. Um, yeah, it'd be great to see you. And we're also thinking next year to start doing some things in either Eindhoven, well, probably in Eindhoven and Arnhem. Uh, we'll probably do like a community building experience or some things like that. I yeah. think Lukash, we should stay in contact. Uh, yeah. As uh, what I hear is that you you're uh, doing so much things which are so valuable for uh, eco villages and communities uh, starting. So let's stay in contact and see if we can work together some more. Absolutely, love it. Great. Yeah, I also want to thank um, the webinar team of Genanel. Cynthia and uh, Marianne and uh, Emre and Mara, who, who are not here today. If someone wants to um, join the webinar team or join Help Gen in whatever way, you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, I, I also want to, to, to tell that every third and fourth Thursday of the month, we have a webinar and next month we have an amazing um, webinar again. I can show you shortly the. I have to scroll through my um, through my uh, computer. We have as a movie. It's not a movie. It's an interview with Charles Eisenstein, separation versus interbeing, and um, th that we are now in a dominant culture about separation and what is the alternative. I don't know if you know Charles Eisenstein, but it's author of Sacred Economics and Climate, the new story. And the interesting thing, it's, it's a start of, it's the beginning of the topic that Henry Mantink will talk about. It's Kijk doorbraak op de aarde, looking at the earth, economy and society in a new way. So that's really something we look forward to. It's published also in a magazine of the Earth. So we expect many participants, not only from Gem. And then uh, we have insurance for eco villages in the end of May. Uh, Ad Flems from Eco Village Buckel has contact with Achmea and they're really interested. It's very often very difficult for cooperation, cooperative or eco village to get insured. And they are willing to tell about how uh, that can be done. They are really enthusiastic about eco villages. And we have another one coming. That's 29 of April. It's Paul Hendrickson offering to give a webinar on climate change and biodiversity loss and extinction rebellion, where he's very active in. So this is just an announcement that I hope we stay connected and that um, I, I really want to thank you for all, all of you, especially, of course, you, Rakesh, bring you this news all over the world, but all of us doing all this local work also to make this world a better place. And now we have, um, I'm not sure if I forgot something. But there are some very interesting links. Uh, Fede put them in the chat about uh, biochar uh, things, and we can share the chat later also. And um, now, if we want, uh, Rakesh offered us to uh, do a bit of dancing. I don't know if you feel like it, but he's a great DJ too. And I think it's a unique opportunity can I see some hands? Who would love to dance a bit? Okay, let's Beautiful. do it then. That's cool. Okay. How, how about you, Rakesh? You feel like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, any any excuse to dance. Absolutely. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's part of my. It's how I keep fit. Is I dance as yeah. as often as I can. So yeah, it's good. No yeah, problem. sitting. They say sitting is the new smoking. Huh? So <laughs> maybe next webinar we should do dancing. <laughs> So I, I wish you all a very good time. And um, for the, those people who 
call it a day and hope we meet again soon. Every second Tuesday of the month is next gen. So the young people of Eco Villages meet and uh, you can find it on uh, uh, Instagram and Facebook where they meet and what is the link. So if you have young people in your community, it's, uh, spread the word and let's stay connected. Stay connected, healthy, free and uh, from my heart to your heart. Let's meet again and let's dance. Let's just